Koti me tūtahi mihi atu ki o koutou, nau mai hara mai ki tēnei mahi, ki tēnei mahi i tēnei pō. Koti me tūtahi mihi atu ki ngā mana whenua, ki ngā te whātua, ki ngā te pāua, ka wāra o maki hoki, ki te wako o tainui, me ngā iwi hapu o te tautukarau. Tēnā rā koutou katoa, ki ngā tangata whenua o tēnei rohe, tēnā rā koutou katoa. Ngā mihi ki o koutou. Um, I, it's a great pleasure and honour to introduce Professor Miles Allen, uh, who's come all the way from Oxford via a little pit stop in Australia. And I also want to acknowledge Miles, um, in addition to the serious business of uh, zero carbon and the challenge of climate change, uh, the fact that you have your dad, uh, Uncle Hubert, who's with us here tonight, Hubert Allen, welcome. And uh, also to acknowledge the um, enormous effort of the Public Policy Institute, who've, uh, and my colleague, Professor Jennifer Martin, who's here, uh, and a busy little bee, I might say. So we've worked very hard to make sure that this happens. And this is the first of four lectures that are going to happen this year as part of the Global Issues series. So we have some other amazing speakers, but we thought we'd start with a bang and probably the most defining issue of our times, which is climate change. And we are incredibly honoured not just to have Miles, but we also have the Chief Science Advisor to the Prime Minister, Professor Juliet Guard, who's here, and Juliet is actually going to do the question and answer session. So there is going to be plenty of opportunity once you've soaked in all of this amazing wisdom and information uh, to ask lots of questions and we look forward to a lively debate. So welcome everyone, great pleasure to have you all here and Noreira, please welcome Professor Miles Allen. Thank you very much Cindy and uh, thank you very much everybody for, for attending tonight. I'll to get this uh, switched on. And so uh, that's picking everything up. Good. So uh, it's, it's a, a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I, I particularly appreciate everybody coming out uh, tonight um, to talk about this issue, particularly in the context of the appalling um, events that have happened in New Zealand over the past week. Um, one of the things I think it brought into focus for me, the events of last Friday, was the school children who were demonstrating about climate change it really should have been their day, and the day was uh, ripped from them by the actions of a single individual. Um, and it does, in many ways, you know, obviously, the, the, I mean, our first thoughts are with the victims, but I'm also thinking about the children who are demonstrating, because as so often with the climate issue, something else comes along, and we're suddenly diverted again to thinking about other things. Um, and this talk is going to be about how we address climate change. I'm often asked about, um, you know, how, how I feel about climate change and how I feel about um, the, the, the urgency for, for action on climate. Um, and a lot of this talk will be quite technical, quite sort of um, bureaucratic almost how you work out, how you design a zero carbon act. It's a very exciting time to be talking about this issue in New Zealand because New Zealand is taking a very progressive, very ambitious stance on the climate issue worldwide. There's also great opportunities for New Zealand to show the world how to do it. Um, but uh, at the same time, it's a time for us to reflect also on the, the overall importance of actually addressing the problem for the world as a whole. So I'm going to talk about um, these uh, sort of three topics. So the long-term, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Climate Agreement um, and what it might mean for New Zealand's uh, Zero Carbon Act. In particular, zero carbon, what does that mean in the context, in particular, of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change special report on 1.5 degrees, which I was heavily involved in and reported in October of last year. And then, then we get a little bit technical, and I hope there's some farmers in the room because this is where it matters for you, um, talking about how we consider methane emissions in the context of a long-term temperature goal. New Zealand has an amazing opportunity in your Zero Carbon Act because not only are you aiming to take a very progressive, 
um, forward-looking stance on climate change, uh, but you're also the first country to actually ser take seriously the prospect of net zero emissions with a large agricultural sector. There have been a few other countries have talked about net zero. Um, Sweden, uh, the UK is kind of talking about it, but not very much, um, and they're talking about other things at the moment, um, but uh, uh, rather incoherently. Um, but uh, Costa Rica um, has, of course, uh, they were the first actually to step up, but of course, the, these countries all have very different um, emissions profiles to yours, and where New Zealand could really play a, a very significant role in the world is showing how it's possible to bring both the extractive industries and a large agricultural sector into a, an effective long-term climate regime addressing our, our long-term temperature goals. So, so that's why I think the, the great opportunity is here. People often say, well, New Zealand's only a small amount of emissions. What difference does it make? If, what difference does our actions make? The, the key difference you can make is as a crucible of climate policy for the world. And that's something that I think you've got a great opportunity to do. So I'll start with the context here, talking about the Paris uh, Climate Agreement signed at the end of 2015, and drawing attention to some crucial articles in the Paris Agreement that, that frame our interpretation of what we mean by net zero and where we're trying to get to in global climate policy. First of all, the overarching objective of the Paris, the Paris Agreement is to limit global and the increase in global average temperature to stop global warming. That may sound sort of vacuous. Of course, it's about stopping global warming. But it might not have been framed that way. We might just have focused at how do we reduce the rate of warming over the next few decades. That would have been, an, that would have been another possible um, goal for the Paris Agreement. Or, or how do we um, limit the warming in 2050? at a particular year. But, but no, that was not what the Paris negotiated ended up at. That was not what the world's countries agreed on. They agreed to limit warming, full stop. And they wanted to keep it well below 2 degrees and pursue efforts towards limiting warming to 1.5 degrees, which was an extraordinarily ambitious goal in the context of where we're at at the moment, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, much less widely noted was Article 4 of the Paris Agreement, everybody focused on this 2 degrees, 1.5 degrees um, uh, numbers in the Paris Agreement, but Article 4 was the sort of enabling article. It was where they said what it was actually going to take to do this. In order to achieve the long-term temperature goal, they acknowledged it was necessary both to reduce emissions, obviously enough, but also to achieve a balance between sources and sinks of greenhouse gases um, in the second half of this century. Um, the, 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 the point about this acknowledgement of the need to achieve balance between sources and sinks, that was the world's governments accepting the case for net zero. In effect, you've got it, the, the net in net zero is that balance between carbon dioxide coming out of the ground and carbon dioxide going back into the ground. Um, or methane being generated and methane being oxidized. And, and you know, that's, that's what's needed for the, world, for, the, for, for the world to stop global warming. It's very easy to get very depressed and, and cynical about uh, climate policy and about the very slow rate of progress in, in climate policy development. But I would just to sort of, before we get on to the nitty gritty and the technical parts of it, I would like to point out what an extraordinary achievement the Paris Agreement was. Only 10 years ago, um, I was, so before the Copenhagen meeting, which ended in a bit of a shambles um, on climate change, where, where there was the, 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 the first real effort for a global um, agreement on greenhouse gas emissions, um, I was attending meetings of the UNFCCC, and, and actually even as late as 2012, talking to people in the UNFCCC process about what it would take uh, to limit warming to any particular level. At that time, they were primarily talking about two degrees. And I was reporting on papers that we published in the scientific community, um, some of which I was involved in, um, in 2009, saying that we would, first reporting that we would actually have to get CO2 emissions to zero um, in order to stop the warming. 
Before then, I think the vast majority of people thought it was a matter of reducing global emissions to about one to two tons of CO2 per person per year, and that was the long-term goal. And in fact, there was a whole model of climate policy in the 2000s, contraction and convergence, how the, the big emitters were going to come down and the small emitters were going to come up, and we were all going to converge on some number in the middle, and that was the overall goal of climate policy. It was a, it was a, it was a nice political goal, it just wasn't, didn't square with the science, because what the science told us was that actually we were going to have to reduce emissions to zero for carbon dioxide, and you know, within the space of only three or four years of those scientific advances being made and the scientific community establishing that that was what was needed, the result was accepted and enshrined in Article 4 of the Paris Climate Agreement. And considering how long governments often take to do rather obvious things about fisheries and so on, I think that was an extraordinary achievement which we have to, you know, praise them for, because you know, there's so much we criticize our governments for, occasionally they do get things right. And this was an example where the world's governments did actually react to evolving science and reflect that in their evolving policies. I was asked to just give you one example, or sort of spend a little bit of time before I got into the nitty gritty of this talk, on the overall context of you know, climate change and the evidence that what we're doing is, uh, the evidence of what we're doing to our planet. Um, and I sort of thought a bit, how can I summarize this as, as, in, as briefly as possible? And I thought I'd just show you an interesting figure from a very old paper dating back to 1977. It's a, it's a figure by Bill Nordhaus, William Nordhaus. He won the Nobel Prize for Economics last year for his work on climate change. Um, it's a figure he wrote in a report. Uh, I'm pretty sure the, the, the line on the left is drawn by hand, bearing in mind this was written in, in the 1970s. And then the dashed line he shows there, he solved one rather simple equation to say what he thought would happen if we continued on a business as usual path in carbon dioxide emissions from then on. Notice at the time William Nordhaus made his prediction, global temperatures were cooling. In fact, there were even some, uh, I think Time magazine had a cover saying, you know, the, you know, talking about the new ice age coming on. This was the, the mid 1970s. And yet, scientists and even some economists understood what was going on with CO2 and were able to say, well, whatever was going on in the ob observed temperatures in the 1970s, they, they had a very strong expectation of what was going to happen next if we carried on with CO2 emissions. The, the right-hand panel here shows you what's observed, what was available to Bill Nordhaus back in 1977, and what's happened since then. And if I just slide that over the top, you can see that, or well, rather depressingly perhaps, Bill Nordhaus did very, very well. Um, he also predicted that as from now, we would see an acceleration in the warming. You'll notice that he's predicting we'd get to two degrees around 2040. Now, we are at the moment, we think, not seeing that acceleration although we're certainly not seeing any slowdown in the warming. Whether, um, you know, time will tell whether we see that acceleration, but it goes to show two very important things. Firstly, we're at one degree now. It's evolving exactly as it was expected to evolve from about 35, 40 years ago. So it's not very complicated what's going on. We do understand what's going on, and it's very clear what's going to happen next if we don't reduce emissions. So what does this mean for actually meeting the Paris goal of limiting warming to well below two degrees and um, pursuing efforts to 1.5? Let's just focus on what it means in particular for the definition of, of net zero and some things I'll come back to in the course of this talk. Um, the Paris Agreement doesn't actually say very explicitly what it means by balance, and that was undoubtedly deliberate, the, the, the diplomats worked out a wording that they could all be happy with, and of course there's always some ambiguity in that. But they are very clear that they want balance in order to meet the long-term temperature goal. Their focus was on global temperature. So in deciding on more precise definitions of balance, it makes sense to ask ourselves, what do they mean for limiting long-term warming? And I'm gonna talk now about what that means, what it will take to meet the long-term temperature goal of the Paris Agreement, 
in the context of this IPCC special report, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that appeared um, in October, uh, tw uh, October of last year. In particular, I'm going to talk about it in the context of this figure, which is one of the summary figures of the report, which shows warming to date in that uh, orange plume, that's the sort of level of human-induced warming to date, showing that we've reached one degree and are warming at 0.2 degrees per decade, so we're warming faster than ever at the moment. There has been, you know, we haven't, we haven't yet seen that massive acceleration that Nordhaus was predicting. We've got to hope we never will, but we, have, we are nevertheless still warming at a rapid rate. Um, and at the rate we're going, we would reach 1.5 degrees sometime between 2030 and around 2050 um, if, if temperatures just carried on rising as they are. What would it take to avoid that, to, to limit warming to 1.5 degrees uh, as the more ambitious goal set out in the Paris Agreement implies? So in this report, we explored this using stylized pathways rather than looking at complicated models of the uh, world economy and global emissions, we just said, okay, let's just imagine if we reduced emissions in a straight line to zero, what would it take, what date would we have to get emissions to zero in order to limit warming to 1.5 degrees? And what this uh, figure which we uh, used to, to illustrate this it, uh, shows is, is two things. First of all, um, the Cumulative, the total amount of carbon dioxide you dump in the atmosphere, determines what temperature you end up at. That's a really important point because carbon dioxide accumulates in the climate system. Global warming will continue until we get CO2 emissions to zero. Um, and that's one of the key drivers of, uh, of, of, of global warming, of the, of the size of the warming we end up at. But we also acknowledged, and this was particularly important in the context of these very ambitious temperature goals like 1.5 degrees, that other drivers of climate change also play a role. And the reason they play a proportionately bigger role for these ambitious temperature goals is if you get CO2 emissions to zero very quickly, then you leave more, you, you, you limit the total amount of warming that's due to CO2. And so if you're causing warming from some other factor, like, like some other agent, like methane, um, that has a proportionately larger effect. So it's also important to consider, as well as considering the total amount of carbon dioxide you dump in the atmosphere, it's also important to consider the net impact on the global energy budget of these other activities, these other human activities that affect global climate. And I, we used this notion of radiative forcing, which is just the global imbalance between incoming and outgoing energy, um, not, not, the change in, not the change which is results from global warming, but the change which causes global warming, so to speak. So this is the, the imbalance caused by a rise in CO2, uh, or an increase in methane emissions, uh, or uh, an increase in particulates uh, from sulfur pollution, which might reflect sunlight back out into space. These all cause a radiative forcing, and our, uh, by definition, a positive radiative forcing causes warming. It traps more energy in the climate system than is allowed to escape, so temperatures rise to compensate. And one of the things we did with this figure is to show there's a very rough and ready equivalence between one watt per square meter of radiative forcing, that's uh, a, a rather weak old-fashioned uh, torch bulb, or you know, your, your phone on standby mode might use a watt. Um, and, uh, and so, so uh, that little trickle of energy for each a square meter of the Earth's surface um, is equivalent in terms of its impact on global temperature to the release of a trillion tons of CO2. So that's a sort of reasonable way to equate these things. Um, and this allows us to see the impact on global temperatures of reducing CO2 emissions to zero by 2055 in this case, um, and the impact of also uh, reducing uh, CO2, to, or reaching net zero uh, at different dates. So here's an illustration of the impact of bringing forward the date of net zero, you can see that uh, by bringing forward the date of net zero, we reduce the total amount of CO2 we dump in the atmosphere, and that lowers global temperatures. It still doesn't avoid 1.5, still doesn't guarantee you avoid 1.5 degrees, but it reduces the risk of going 
substantially over 1.5 degrees. It's, we also illustrate the importance of these other drivers, um, the, the radiative forcing due to the combined effect of other forms of anthropogenic pollution in the atmosphere, and that also has an impact on long-term global temperatures. In most scenarios, radiative forcing due to other drivers is projected to decline after 2030, um, but if we don't manage to get it down after 2030, that will reduce our chances of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees. What does, this, what does zero emissions mean for global temperatures? So in the context, this is another figure from the report. Um, I've, I'm sort of slightly lazily using a figure which has too many lines on it for you. Apologies for that. But I want you to just focus on some of the lines in this figure. M many, you know, on, for CO2, um, the implications, the way we relate carbon dioxide to global temperatures is really simple. If you stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere, you stop the warming. So the, the relationship between carbon dioxide and warming is really straightforward. But because other gases affect the climate in different ways, if you just stop all emissions of all gases simultaneously, the reaction of the climate system is slightly more complicated. It's shown by this yellow line here. Slightly surprisingly, perhaps, for you, we actually see a small short-term warming after we shut off all emissions. And that's because many of the factors which we release into the atmosphere, which affect climate, actually cause cooling. These are the, the particulates generated by sulfate aerosols. But they are, they're very short-lived. So they're washed out of the atmosphere very quickly. So you get that small bounce. And then very soon after that, we see a cooling due to the decline of methane concentrations in the atmosphere having shut off methane emissions. We're going to unpack all this as I go through the, the impact of methane on global temperatures um, as, we, as we get on through the lecture, so don't worry if you... But this, my, the main message of this figure is, if you just shut off all emissions, the, 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 the response of the climate system is a bit complicated. It's not a really simple thing that shut off emissions and then um, temperatures will stop. A much simpler um, response is shown by the, the, the blue line, which is a, a different way of thinking about shutting off emissions or, or stopping global warming, if you like. And this is just what happens when you stop CO2 emissions, you stop carbon dioxide emissions, and you stop the increase in radiative forcing due to other agents. So it's very simple. You, you, you stop carbon dioxide emissions, reduce them to zero, and then you just stabilize the global energy imbalance due to other uh, human activities. If you do that, you can see the response is much simpler. The global warming just stops. There's a very, very small increase. OK? Notice it does go up a little bit. And that's a very important increase for some people. So we will be dwelling on that in the course of this lecture. And I will explain to you where that's coming from. But the big picture, if you stop carbon dioxide emissions and if you stabilize the radiative forcing, the global energy imbalance due to other factors, you stop the warming. So at a very big scale, it's very clear what we have to do. We've got to stop CO2 emissions and stabilize everything else. How fast does radi this radiative forcing, this sort of net impact of other factors, have to decline in order to stop global warming? So we've already said we need zero CO2 emissions. And we need, because of that tiny extra warming that was carrying on, we, we need to correct for that by declining radiative forcing due to other agents. And the answer is, if we just look at the response to CO2 emissions and what it would take to stabilize warming, the answer is pretty straightforward. It's about a third of a percent per year. That's the rate at which we have to decline radiative forcing in order to keep temperatures level after we've stopped our CO2 emissions. So what does this mean in terms of our interpretation of balance, and in particular in the context of the Paris Agreement, and what this might imply for the design of New Zealand's Net Zero Carbon Act. Well, if balance is interpreted as what it'll take to halt global warming, I've qualified this slightly as on decadal timescales because I can't really tell you what it'll take 
to stop global warming on multi-century timescales because other factors will come into play here. So I'm really focused on what it would take to stop global warming this century. Then the answer's pretty clear from the science we have available. We need to get global CO2 emissions to zero. Um, we need to make sure that there is no further warming caused by other human activities. And that's equivalent to global non-CO2 rated forcing, that's the net impact on the global energy budget of all the other things we do, declining by a third of a percent per year. So those are the two things you need to do to stop global warming. But what does that mean for these other greenhouse gases, in particular for methane and nitrous oxide? So these show you a, uh, a, a scenario in which we do stop global warming. So it's, it's a, you might say it's a very optimistic scenario. It's one in which we reduce emissions very rapidly, um, and uh, both uh, we, we stabilize emissions of nitrous oxide, we reduce emissions of methane, and we uh, reduce emissions of CO2 um, dramatically all the way down to zero and below zero. And the left-hand panel shows you annual emissions in this scenario, and the right-hand panel shows you the warming caused by these different gases. Um, to a very good approximation, you can just add up these warmings and you get the total human-induced warming. So you can do that in your head, but the point here is not to talk particularly about whether this scenario gets to 1.4 degrees or 1.6 degrees or whatever, but to talk about how emissions of the different gases relate to the warming they cause. So that's the question. Um, for CO2, for carbon dioxide, the answer is very simple. Carbon dioxide accumulates in the climate system. So whenever you add a ton of carbon, a ton of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you drive up global temperatures. It doesn't matter whether you added it 100 years ago, you're adding it today, or whether you add it in future, it has the same ratchet impact on global temperatures. So if I just add up the CO2 emissions in the left-hand panel, I just integrate them over time, and plot that as a dotted line on the right-hand panel, you can see you don't really need climate scientists. You, you know exactly what's going to happen. There's a, there's a very clear, simple relationship between cumulative carbon dioxide emissions and the warming they cause. This, the relationship is it's uncertain because we don't know exactly how much warming a ton of carbon dioxide um, uh, causes, but it's, it's, it, the, the, the form of it is known. So we know that it's cumulative. We don't know how much, the, the number might be uncertain, but the shape of that curve is very well understood and very well defined by climate science. Um, it pretty much works um, by, for nitrous oxide as well. There's only one extra element you need to bring in, which is to take into account that a molecule of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere actually has more impact on the global energy budget than a molecule of carbon dioxide or a ton of nitrous oxide in the atmosphere has more impact than a ton of carbon dioxide. And so we have to introduce a, an exchange rate, a scaling factor called a global warming potential. And so you'll see this little phrase GWP100 featuring in these slides. And that's just an exchange rate. It's a number we multiply nitrous oxide by to make it equivalent, notionally equivalent to CO2. And then we can do exactly the same thing as we did with carbon dioxide, and you can see it works reasonably well, at least down to 2050 or so. So nitrous oxide is also a cumulative pollutant. You can add up nitrous oxide emissions over time, and you get their impact on global temperature. And the obvious implication of that is if you want to stop nitrous oxide causing global warming, you have to either reduce nitrous oxide emissions to zero, or you have to compensate for any remaining nitrous oxide emissions by active removal of carbon dioxide. So these gases are straightforward. There's not a lot of science that needs to be done. Now what about methane? So we try and do the same trick with methane, and it goes badly. Okay? It looks like it's working very well up until the present, and then suddenly it all falls to bits. Okay? So just adding up methane emissions over time doesn't allow you to predict methane-induced warming. And adopting a different number to multiply your methane by, there's a lively debate among environmentalists about whether we should use GWP100 or GWP20. This is completely irrelevant to this problem, 
because that's just adopting a different scaling factor, which would scale that dotted line up and down, it wouldn't make any difference to the fact that the dotted line that I'm, you can see behind the blue dotted line you can see behind me doesn't look remotely like the blue solid line. In other words, you can't just add up methane emissions to find out what warming they cause, so you can't treat methane as equivalent to a certain amount of CO2. It just doesn't behave in the same way. Well, what can you do? You could look at these lines and think, well, the, the blue solid line on the right looks a bit like the blue solid line on the left. So maybe it's methane. The, it's the rate of methane emissions that are driving, it's driving methane-induced warming, not the, the, the integral over time. So, so rather than adding up methane emissions over time, perhaps you should just take the rate at which we're emitting methane into the atmosphere, and perhaps that would do a better job of predicting um, the response of global temperatures. And we can try that, and it does a bit better, but not particularly well. You can see now the problem is not that the blue dotted line was overshooting the blue solid line, but it seems to be undershooting it now. So we've got a problem in the opposite direction. So can we do better than that? Well, we can. We can just combine. So, so methane has two, in effect, has two impacts on global temperatures. It has some apparent cumulative impact, and I'll explain you why it has an apparent cumulative impact in a minute, and you can combine that with the impact of the methane emission rates to give you something which predicts global warming very well indeed. So here's the only formula that we'll show you in this, uh, in this uh, talk. Um, forgive the formula, but I'm a physicist and I like to show formulae. Um, but if you just take now the dotted blue line, is just the annual uh, methane emission rate multiplied by 75. Where does 75 come from? I'll explain that in a minute. Plus cumulative methane emissions added up over time multiplied by a quarter, um, all multiplied by the GWP and the transient climate response to emissions. That's the factor which allows you to convert CO2 emissions into temperature. And suddenly, we've got a very good predictor of future temperatures. So we now appear to be able to understand how methane is affecting global temperatures. Where do all these numbers come from? Well, you've seen them before. Um, cumulative, just by definition, cumulative methane emissions increase at the annual meth methane emission rate. I hope that's reasonably obvious. You know, you're, you're adding up emissions over time. The rate at which the emissions add up over time is just proportional to your current rate of emissions. And 0.25 is 0.3%, 0.333% if you want to be pedantic, of 75, okay? The 0.3% is a number you should remember because we talked about it earlier. Um, if you want to make emission, if you want to stop methane-induced warming, you need methane emissions to decline at 0.3% per year. And therefore, if you want to something which equates methane with zero CO2 emissions, you need a formula that would give you zero CO2 emissions if the methane emissions were declining at 0.3% per year. And if you sort of gaze at these numbers, you realize that that's what we've got here. So the crucial point here is that reducing methane emissions by 0.3% per year reducing methane's radiative forcing by the same amount and therefore causes no further warming. That's where it comes from. You've seen this figure before. That 0.3% per year is to compensate for the slow centennial timescale adjustment to the warming caused by past methane emissions. So if you're a bit puzzled by this and you think, well, methane's short-lived, so if I have a steady emission of methane over, you know, since 2000 BC, what, why is that still causing global warming? Well, you'd be right, it wouldn't be. But most of our methane emissions um, are actually caused, you know, most of our sources of methane emissions began in the past century or so. New Zealand wasn't generating methane 300 years ago. Um, the methane's, methane has increased over the past century, and this 0.3% per year is to address that. So here we are as a summary of where we get to. The, the standard, if you like, the sort of the European Commission's way of um, uh, equating uh, carbon dioxide and methane suggests that um, these three, so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to sort of illustrate that, um, with three idealized scenarios for methane emissions. So the first case, 
we've got methane, uh, you know, one ton of methane per year or 100 tons or whatever um, at the beginning, and it increases by 25% over 30 years. What does that do to global temperatures? It causes warming. If it falls by 10% over 30 years, that would cause, that would have no impact on global temperatures. That would be equivalent to stable global temperatures. If we reduce it by more than 10% over 30 years, that would cause cooling. Um, using the European Commission's approach to equating things in, the Europe, in Europe's emission trading system, these would all be regarded as equivalent to a certain amount, around 800 uh, tons of CO2, um, all of which would cause warming. So they have very different impacts on global temperature. Using the formula I just showed you, that increase by 25% would be equivalent to positive carbon dioxide emissions and cause warming. A gentle decrease by 10% over 30 years would be equivalent to zero CO2 emissions, which would be stable. And a reduction faster than 10% over 30 years would actually cause cooling. So that would be equivalent to removing CO2 from the atmosphere. The only way you can cool temperatures using CO2 is to actually take CO2 physically back out of the atmosphere. So here are New Zealand's emissions, the standard way of accounting for them. It looks like your methane emissions are higher than your CO2 emissions. And if we add up emissions over time since 1990, it looks again, like, well, Obviously, the, the methane line, the blue line, is, is higher than the CO2 line. So, you know, plenty of people saying methane is the main problem in, uh, in New Zealand's emissions. But I hope by now you're, you're wondering to yourself, well, I wonder what these emissions are doing to global temperatures. Here they are. These are the contributions of New Zealand's emissions to global temperatures. On the left, the contribution of New Zealand's emissions to the current global warming rate. Okay, so that's how fast are you pushing up global temperatures. Red CO2, blue's methane, and green is nitrous oxide. And on the right is the contribution of these different emissions to warming since 1990 um, due to New Zealand emissions. Um, the units here are, of course, quite small. Millikelvin, thousandths of a degree. Okay, because New Zealand is a small fraction of the global population. But if you like to take this figure and, and sort of feel smug and think, well, we're not doing any damage, try multiplying the numbers by the ratio of the global population to the population of New Zealand and see what would be happening to global temperatures if the whole world were emitting like New Zealand's emitting. I'll leave that as an exercise. It's easy to do. But you may, not, you, you, you may find the answers interesting. So the standard way of accounting for emissions does a terrible job of telling you what those emissions are doing to global temperatures. It, it's fine for CO2 and nitrous oxide, but it's, it's, it's rubbish for methane. Can we do better than that? Well, this is this alternative formula that I gave you earlier on, which uses a combination of the methane emission rate and cumulative methane emissions to predict, uh, to, to equate methane with a certain amount of CO2. Um, and it seems to do a much better job of predicting the impact of methane emissions on global temperatures. So using this revised formula for equating methane to CO2, you get something that maps onto global temperatures in the same way that CO2 does, which means you're understanding how these different gases contribute to global temperatures in the same way. So these two things are equivalent drivers of climate change. On the one hand, we have a disused power station. It caused global warming back when it was running a long time ago, but it's no longer causing global warming. At the bottom, we have a, uh, I believe these are Northern Irish cattle, I apologize, um, but you know, I, I've no objection to Ireland. Um, and, uh, but you, you can imagine this herd somewhere in New Zealand. This is a gently declining herd of cattle or a herd of cattle where the farmer is using a combination of feed additives or, or uh, these, these ideas about uh, 
um, inoculations to reduce methanogens or something, to reduce methane emissions gently um, by 0.3% per year or 10% over 30 years. So these, this herd of cattle caused warming back in the day when the farmer's great-grandmother or grandfather built up the herd, but it's no longer causing warming today. So these two things are equivalent, and yet they would be treated very differently in an emission trading system. So what are the implications, just to wrap up, for New Zealand's Zero Carbon Act? I'm very conscious of the fact that we've got New Zealand's chief scientist in the room, and so I need to be quite cautious here. And the first thing you have to remember is be very careful about taking policy advice from a physicist. Um, but I will sort of illustrate some interesting thought examples from, as it were, a spherical cow perspective um, on New Zealand's uh, greenhouse, on, on New Zealand's Zero Carbon Act and how you could treat methane emissions within it. Here's the formula, top line, which shows you, and the elements of this formula should be making sense to you because you've seen them already. It's 25% of cumulative emissions plus 75, so it's 0.25 times um, uh, cumulative emissions plus 75 times the rate of change of emissions. You add these two things together, and I showed you many figures to show that this is a really good predictor of impact on global warming. So um, I'm now just going to present you the formula again and say, well, what, ha what does it mean for the impact of our spherical cow, as it were, on global temperatures? Well, again, this is talking like a physicist. Cre if you create one new cow, okay, a physicist would do this, you know, by sort of imagining a cow. Of course, there's more it's more complicated than that, isn't it? But I'm not a biologist. I don't need to worry about this. If you create one new cow, that has the impact of increasing methane emissions into the atmosphere by 100 kilograms of methane per year, roughly speaking. Again, we're just talking round numbers here. That has the same impact on global temperature as a one-off release of over 200 tons of CO2, 50 round trips from Auckland to London. Okay? That's a sobering number. It also creates a sustained emission, it's equivalent to a sustained emission from now on, of only a seven, that's a 700 kilograms of CO2 into the atmosphere. These are where those numbers come from. There's the 28, that's this GWP number. I'm just using the standard number from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's the 75. And that's the increase in methane emissions resulting from the addition of one new cow. That's the 28 again, and that's the 0.25. So you can see where all these numbers come from. If I destroy one old cow, again, talking, a physicist would say if I annihilate an old cow, probably, by colliding it with an anti-cow. Anyway, um, so if I destroy one old cow, then I would decrease methane emissions by 100 kilograms of methane per year, and that would be equivalent to one-off removal of 210 tons of CO2 and a sustained removal from now on of, 70, uh, of, of 700 kilos of CO2 per year. Under a European-style emission trading scheme, those would be considered equivalent to sustained emission of 2.8 tons of CO2 and no, and then they leave out the, the 210 tons entirely. Okay? So it's just wrong. Yes, you should say, hmm. Okay? Because how can, the, how can you be so ridiculous? Well, in Europe, they don't care because they don't really care about methane very much. It's not a big part of Europe's emissions. And so, um, as far as the European Commission is concerned, this is all a sideshow. Okay? That's not the case for Ireland. Ireland feels rather strongly about this. But, uh, but most countries in Europe don't really see this as a large priority. This is going to become a priority as countries with large agricultural sectors and large methane emissions start to engage seriously in climate policy to achieve net zero. And that's why it's so important what New Zealand does in this space. Because you can demonstrate to the world how we can address and frame a coherent climate policy which addresses both emissions of CO2 and emissions of methane in a framework that achieves the aims of the Paris Climate Agreement. Just to emphasize the point of you know, what this could mean, if methane were just dumped into a European-style emission trading system at you know, the approximate current rate of 25 New Zealand dollars per tonne of CO2, 
then a farmer who's managing to reduce their methane emissions by 0.3% uh, per year, um, they'd still be paying 70 New Zealand dollars per cow into the emission trading system, even though they weren't causing any global warming. And they might get a little grumpy about that. Farmers, perhaps worse, farmers who decide to increase their methane emissions would pay exactly the same rates for new versus old cows. There'd be no penalty for increasing, there'd be no specific penalty for increasing your methane emissions, even though increasing methane emissions has a disproportionately vast impact on global temperatures. In fact, you know, every new cow is equivalent to a one-off release of 5,000 New Zealand dollars worth of CO2. And of course, farmers reducing their methane emissions faster than 0.3% per year would get no credit for actually helping offset the warming impact of other emissions. So, just to wrap up, what, what I think should happen, I mean, it's very easy, you often hear academics droning on about how um, everybody's got it wrong and, and whinging. So, you know, any fool can criticize, condemn, and complain, most fools do, so what's a better way of doing it? Um, New Zealand's net zero could, could provide a, a model for the world. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna, I mean, it's, it's not up to me to tell you how to do it, that, that's your job. Um, no, but it's, 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 it's not up to me to say um, how the act should be framed, but it would, um, be a, it would be a model for the world, and it would be a world first, if the act was, first of all, completely transparent in what it was trying to achieve. Is the aim of the act to stop New Zealand's contribution to global warming? In which case, say so, and then say how the instruments in the act contribute to that goal. It would be great if it was coherent across different gases and sectors. There are so many incoherences in other countries' climate policies that a model, you know, a model for the world of how you could treat things separately, in particular, avoiding pretending that agricultural carbon dioxide is somehow different from non-agricultural carbon dioxide. I'm sorry, a molecule of carbon dioxide is a molecule of carbon dioxide. You can't make a distinction between agricultural emissions and other emissions. Crucially, you can't ignore methane. Do not take this lecture away as saying, ah, oh, methane's off the hook, we don't need to worry about it. But don't make the European Union's mistake of pretending it's some kind of equivalent CO2. And ideally, you want it to be simple in how the different elements of the act contribute to achieving its long-term goal. By far the simplest thing to do at this stage, and I appreciate you are well advanced in your thinking on this, we certainly contributed to the public consultation last year, and I think it was fantastic that you did that consultation and gave everybody a chance to chip in and feed in different ideas on how the act could be framed. Um, at the moment, I think the, the Productivity Commission's proposal of separate targets for methane versus CO on the one hand and CO2 and nitrous oxide on the other um, is by far the, the simplest way forward. Uh, the one thing I would want urge you to add to that discussion is to open a public discussion about what these targets mean for how much these different gases are contributing to global temperature. And using the little formula in this lecture, which is of course available through the, um, through the, the PowerPoint uh, by request, um, you can go away and calculate it and join that discussion. And so the crucial point here is this should be an open discussion about how different gases are contributing to achieving the long-term temperature goal. If New Zealand decides to use methane emissions to compensate for the warming impact of other gases, to use methane-induced cooling to compensate for CO2-induced warming, if that's the public decision, that's great. That's, that's the way, that, that's, a, that's obviously a, if, if everybody's happy with that agreement, then that's open and available to, 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 for, for, for public discussion. Um, but the crucial point is, don't sort of hide in the accounting tricks, if you like. It is actually straightforward to work out what these different measures achieve for global temperatures so that everybody can understand how different sectors are contributing to the overall goal, which is, of course, ultimately the very laudable goal of stopping global warming. So I hope this lecture has provided some ideas of how tools could be fed in to this public discussion to make the Zero Carbon Act as successful, robust, and long-lasting as possible. And I hope that we look back in 2050 to a Zero Carbon Act that really paved the way for all of the countries of the world with large agricultural sectors to take up the challenge set down by the Paris Climate Agreement. Thank you.